America, my name is Ayame Ose Frimpong, and you're here watching The Black Athenians. And I'm going to tell you a little story. Gather around, people. Let's get, tell a little story. I was at an NAACP morning, uh, meeting a few weeks ago, and first of all, join your local NAACP. I'm going to do an entire different show about why that's important, but it's important. So join your, NAACP, your local NAACP, but me, you know, trying to be a you know, good little you know, citizen who cares about the advancement of colored people. I uh, went to my local NAACP meeting, and people were lamenting about how there aren't civil rights lawyers in the community, about we need more lawyers, all of our people want it. There are two claims. One, all of our young boys and girls, they just want to go be basketball players or uh, be hip-hop hip -hop artists. And then someone said, well, you know, that's a problem, but also the problem is the lawyers who are here, they just care about the money. That's all they care about, the money. Um, they're not into that old time, Thurgood Marshall, um, civil rights life. And uh, somehow they don't care about the money. And I want to say first, that's two distinct problems. Either we're not producing the right, enough lawyers, or the lawyers we're producing are all about the money. Or they're leaving town. Or they're leaving town because the money is in Atlanta or in Washington, D.C. Um, so, so that's an issue, except uh, it's, it's two distinct issues. Right? And, I want to be very, and I want to be very clear about it being two distinct issues. And we're going to talk about the second part of that right now. Because if it's the case that we're producing lawyers, but the lawyers that we're producing don't really care about the community, that might be just a little bit on us. And I think it's because we don't talk about political education. So we're going to hit the intro, and then we're going to get into it. Never change the ways for the world or the government If it was the president, then I would stay fat You leave it up to me, I paint the White House black And ain't no future in your front All right, people, so um, It might be just a little bit about us Now remember, when I do this show, I always blame black people last People like to blame black people first I blame them last, so it's just a little bit about us um, but uh, before we get to that business, I want to say first, none of this is possible without Broderick Flanagan. My intern, who's actually wonderful, Matthew, is on vacation right now because Matthew's a student at UGA. He was one of my favorite students uh, in a class I taught, and I asked him if he wanted to do some work for me, but uh, he, is, he went home for the break, so I'm doing the tech stuff as I, you know, try to dispense what meager wisdom I have. Um, so, uh, first of all, if you know anybody who in Athens who might want to intern for the show, I'm trying to build a fleet. Uh, the week after I, I do this show, um, the week after Thanksgiving, it's going to be uh, guest hosted by Imani Blackwell, I believe is her name. And um, it's going to be guest hosted by Amanda Blackwell. So I want to start creating a, a stable of people who can both host and do the tech stuff because I want to build capacity. Just in case something happens to me, the show will live on. So let nothing happen to me because just know that if something happens to me, there's going to be flames. <laughs> um, I always say, well, I don't, well, let it be known. Let me make this very clear. All right. So I'm going to say a lot of provocative things in the next hour. And, um, and the things I say are going to be geared towards redistributing some of the money that exists in Athens and in Oconee County to some of the black people in Athens. And some people might say that, like, well, if we just take out IME, the problem will, starve, will stop. <laughs> Let me be very clear. If something happens to me, if I get sick, I ran a marathon a few years ago, I'm in very good shape. If I get hit on my bicycle, I'm also very agile. So if something happens to me, I didn't trip. It's not my fault. I was hit. It was a plot. And most importantly, I don't forgive anybody for anything. Don't let some black preacher come on TV and says he would have forgotten. No, I don't forgive anybody for anything. I wanted to shut it down. 
So if you don't want it to shut, if you don't want the city, and I want fires all over the United States, this is YouTube. I want fires all over the United States. I want to burn it in St. Louis. I want to burn it in Columbia. I want, I want, I want burning in, in Washington, D.C. Anywhere there are Negroes who are upset and white allies, I want you throwing those Molotov cocktails too. Um, if anything happens to me, it was a blow against the movement and I want the movement to blow back. <laughs> <laughs> so the best thing for to avoid that is to make sure that nothing happens to me. I'm not going out like Malcolm X. <laughs> if you hear someone say, get your head out of my pocket. <laughs> I'm hitting the door. I'm in the floor. <laughs> I'm, not, that's not, I'm not going out like that. Um, but I'm still going to do the work that it'll take to build a black middle class. And remember, when I say build a black middle class, that doesn't mean keep the black middle class that's already there, because a lot of you guys got there by doing some grimy things. I mean, moving the black working poor up. Um, so I want to say that none of this is possible without the courage, the wherewithal, and the acumen of Broderick Flanagan. Broderick Flanagan is a local artist. I'm going to uh, put up a quick picture of Broderick just so you know who I'm talking about. Um, he's a local artist who um, does many of the mules around town, many of the mules in Athens. And also, he's taught in schools. And also, he does corporate retreats if you need. Like, it's very stressful. Maybe you need to learn how to like, make cartoons. So um, if you want to hire Broderick for your corporate retreat, for your bat mitzvah, or for your quinceanera, Broderick is available. So just, you know, you Google Broderick Philanigan um, Studios. And, and he will come and like do art classes for you, for your neighborhood, for your community um, gathering. And he has uh, very reasonable rates. Also, he's, uh, he runs Enlightenment Media Productions, Enlightened Media Productions, which is um, a black business consulting and, uh, agency which will hook your, black, your white company up with a black business. So if you have a wedding and you're like, well, you know, I could go to my, tis, my, my, sister's, uh, my sister Tiffany's place, but Tiffany's doing fine. And instead of and giving your money to Tiffany, you should give it to a black person in that company or in Athens, and, but you don't know any black beauticians. You know who does know black beauticians? Broderick. Broderick does, right? So you talk to Broderick, Broderick hooks you up with the black beauticians in town, or, you know, it's not just, be, like, we do, we do all the things. You need a black um, um, uh, uh, electrician or plumber, Broderick is the guy to hook up. Also, as I was thinking about organizing the show, I thought about, um, you know, like a good young man who grew up when I grew up, there was always a Jet and an Ebony magazine on our kitchen table. I, was in, I grew up in California, if you don't know. I'm in Athens, Georgia right now, but I grew up in California. I can't afford to live in California right now because it's a little very expensive. So I'm coming home, and if I'm going to live in Athens, Georgia, Athens, Georgia is going to have to live with me. Um, so, uh, so my mom moved out from South Carolina to, Athens, uh, to California now. I'm, I'm, I'm in Athens, Georgia, and I'm, gonna, I'm, here, I'm here for a stretch. I'm here to stay. So, but in growing up, there was always a Jet magazine and an Ebony, I believe, mostly Jet. Um, so there was always a Jet in, in, in the house. And, uh, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who grew up with a Jet magazine in the house. And you can't think of Jet magazine without thinking about the Jet beauty of the week, right? Well, this is where we'd meet uh, LaDonna, who was also a school teacher, a postal worker, uh, who liked long walks on the beach and the Lord. And she was just looking for, <laughs> and she was looking for, um, you know, you know, a, a soulmate. And, and so there was, there was Jet, and then in every Jet, there was a Jet Beauty of the Meek week. Um, so yeah, so that was, uh, so that was an amusing part of my childhood. And I was like, how could I, f I f uh, put that in my show also? And I was thinking, you know what I could do? I could feature a black business for the week, every week. So every week I'm going to feature one of our local black businesses. And this is uh, Aaron's Locksmith, who is a wonderful, uh, wonderful locksmith in town. Uh, just if you put in Google, Aaron Locksmith, Athens, he'll come up. He's a fantastic guy. We came out. I locked my keys 
lost my keys when I was in Lowe's. And so like it was very complicated and I had to get in my car. So I called the blacks, uh, blocks, uh, the locksmith and Aaron came out and we started talking and we started talking about how we're going to build a black middle class. And he was like, you know, the legacy of slavery is still with us and the trauma. And so like it was me and Aaron getting into, you know, Negro to Negro as he opened up my car door. And uh, so I think you too should use Aaron and not just when you lock yourself out of your car. He also does like home installations. And also if you're a business and you need all, if you're a management company, a condo management company, I'm sure Aaron would appreciate that contract. Uh, you know, if anybody knows Wes at, at Landmark, that would be pretty good if we got Aaron that contract because there are a lot of locks in those condominiums. Um, and uh, there's no reason if, uh, like, if we're going to hire a locksmith, I wouldn't mind it being a black locksmith because we've locked the black locksmith out of so many of the uh, Athens. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we've locked the black locksmith out of, and I'm trying to open that lock uh, with this show. So if you have any locksmithing needs, um, Aaron, locksmith in Athens, Hook him up. He's a good guy. And he hires people from the community to do this work, which means he's also training people in the community to do this work. So if you're in charge of any, um, any contracting or if you're in charge of procurement, maybe don't give it to the locksmith who's been doing it four or five generations because that locksmith probably isn't black um, for a variety of reasons. Use Aaron instead. That way we create the next generation of locksmith. So... Now we're going to talk about the necessity of political education uh, for any of us to be free. So why do we have, why do we have so many, um, why do we have black lawyers, but, no, but apparently according to this meeting I went to at the civil rights, um, at the NAACP, why do we have so many black lawyers, but they aren't doing that work that we need them to do uh, in terms of civil rights? How is that the case? The problem is in political education. And I know that's going to be hard to, to take for a lot of you people because we think, you know, we, 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 we trained our kids to be successful. We trained our kids to be um, responsible, good Americans. How, how are you telling us that we failed them by not giving us, them a political education? Well, we failed them because... We train them to be a kind of successful. We train them to be a quality of successful. That's not all that we need as black people, as people um, in the United States. And the kind of successful we train them to be isn't actually consistent with growing black communities. We've trained them to get out. We've, we've, we've identified success with escape, success with being the exception. In Athens, um, Greg Davis, who's actually here, uh, posted, uh, he's a school board member, he posted, said, that, like, look, I just, I, I was minding my business being a good school board member, um, and I was at a meeting, and I just heard that 4% of, of people born in poverty in Athens make it solidly to the middle class, and I'll say that again, 4% of children born in poverty, in Athens, make it solidly to the middle class. So even success, if that's the case, means you've escaped everyone you've born around. You've escaped all your cousins, because they're probably broke too. Um, that means you've hit some sort of lottery. That means you've won the Hunger Games. And that's a problem, because being middle class in Athens, if you're born poor, shouldn't be the equivalent of winning the Hunger Games. Instead of beating the odds, we need to change the odds so 84% of those people born in poverty make it to um, uh, the solid middle class, which means pretty much eradicating uh, lifetime poverty, uh, which is possible because in Athens proper, uh, we have a uh, 8.5 and up billion dollar GDP. So it's not the issue. The issue isn't that um, there isn't money generated in Athens. It's just this poor, depressed town. Um, like, I don't know. Hate to break it to you. Gary's a little bit depressing. Uh, Gary, Indiana, if you ever been there, it's... Uh, so it's not... Athens is not Gary. Um, it's, there's a lot of money being made into Athens. It's just shunted into non-black people for reasons uh, due to a history of t terrorism. But we need the quality of politics that will redistribute that money to Athens, uh, to black Athens, which is about 30% of the population. So we get the quality of politics that will 
redistribute money into Black Athens, and we get the the middle class that that Athens deserves, which includes a Black middle class. Why don't we have that? Because we don't have the quality of political education that knows to fight for it. And now I'm going to give you Chairman Fred Hampton. Now remember, Fred Hampton was the chairman of the Black Panther Party in Chicago when he was making he was killed. Uh, when he was 21, and everyone talks about the, the horrible circumstances surrounding his death, this is about his life and the quality of leader he was. Uh, he was brought in this meeting that I'm about to show you. He was brought in as a consultant. Um, he was brought in as a consultant for people, um, for another black power group uh, who wanted just uh, to, to have Fred Hampton think, help them think through their issues about what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong because everyone's just trying to lift the black community. So this is Fred Hampton uh, being a consultant for another black, pad, uh, black power group in the 60s. There's no educational program here? Uh, that's come out of social action. And, you know, you set that up, brother. I mean, we can't put everything on one piece of paper. What about this bank? Credit union? Mm -hmm. Credit union. Credit union, my brother. Is a bank. If you're hip to, are you hip to credit unions? It is a bank. Yeah, so you go and buy money? Yeah. yeah. It's a bank. It's a bank. Owned by the people. Run for the people. And by the people. Mm -hmm. What will money be given out to people for? Well, the people would decide that. You want to buy, you know, whatever, you know, the people in the community would decide. You need some living room furniture, maybe? You need a car, maybe? See, I got the thing is with me, you dig, I, I need to know some more about it. I wish you had some more literature about the educational thing here. Because, you dig, as far as we're concerned in, uh, in the struggle, the way we look at struggle is that uh, this depends on the educational thing, you dig. Because uh, this depends on the education. Well, the whole thing. You know, no, but in the end, this does. You, you can form this with no education. You can uh, form this, this. No, not the way we're talking about forming it. You know, right. We're talking about forming it right. You know, it's not on the paper. We didn't write it on no, the paper. Form it right. No education. No. Let me give you an example. No, no, no. Uh, you, Yo Mo Kenyatta formed the excellent revolution with no education. And on the day of the end thing, Yo Mo told the motherfucker, I said, well, uh, you know, uh, you can educate the, uh, uh, hate the enemy, but uh, I'm your brother. I'll help you lead the revolution. Now I'm more pressure. Another example, Papa Doc in Haiti. Papa Doc in Haiti hated everything white. Man, you couldn't put this white paper in front of Papa Doc's face. Seeing but he moved all the white people out and he took over and be oppressed. Yeah, he did, because of no education. Well, and the people that had been educated, they just said that we don't hate the motherfucker uh, white people, we hate the oppressor, whether he be white, black, brown, or yellow. So we got to know the educational program to find out what is going to be in the finale. A lot of people work. Yo Mo Kenyatta is called not a never a revolutionary, but an ex-revolutionary. So it's Papa Doc. They brought on a successful revolution. That thing in the uh, Mau was a bitch. Bantu freedom fighters, all that kind of action. But what we're saying is, that it's the end. But you don't judge Castro now. You can't do it. Nobody in this room could judge whether Castro's going to be a revolutionary or not. Uh, you know what I mean? We're talking about things, you know what I mean, uh, with uh, China, the People's Republic, and even at the stage they're in now, talking about even going on further into a communistic state. That's what we're talking about. That was a revolutionary. So we got to understand here the educational program that you have to be able to figure out whether it will go on the right lines, where the people will end up in a situation where they can be able to really control themselves. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, with no education, the people that take this local foundation and start stealing money because they won't be really educated to why it's the people's thing anyway. You understand what I'm saying? With no education, you have neo-colonialism instead of colonialism, like you got in uh, uh, Africa now, like you got in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Haiti. So what we're talking about is there has to be uh, an educational program. That's very important. As a matter of fact, we are so important for us that a person has to go through six weeks of our political education before he can consider himself a member of the party, able to even run down ideology for the party. Why? Because if they don't have an education, then they know where. You dig what I'm saying? They know where, because they don't even know why they're doing what they're doing. You, you might get people caught up in an emotionless movement. Uh, you understand me? You might be able to get them caught up in because they're poor and they want something. And then if they're not educated, they want more. And before you know it, they'll be capitalists. And before you know it, we'll have Negro imperialists. Yeah, but you see, brother, uh, the reason we don't do a lot of talking because what you say is a foregone conclusion with us. <sighs> yeah, well, see, brother, the reason I do do a lot of talking is because I don't, there's no foregone conclusion with me. There's no education program. All right, so that was Fred Hampton telling you that without an education program, people don't even know why they're, what, why they're doing what they're doing. Without an education program, people don't even know why they're doing what they're doing. And I think that's important because now 
we've, we've, the problem the NAACP was facing was that we've produced all of these lawyers, but they don't know why we spent so much time and energy producing these lawyers. They think it's for them. They think it was, it was a matter of their individual come up. Um, and that's the problem. That's the problem. Without education, you don't know that wealth isn't an individual property. So that even if you're part of for the, um, even if you're part of that four percent who makes it out of poverty, you're still not wealthy. You're still not wealthy because wealth is a community property. Wealth is about like the the, the net worth of the people who went to your wedding, not the not the net worth of your the 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 income you happen to have. Wealth is how can you can you gather $100,000 to make a capital requirement in order to make a bid for a contract, uh, for a government contract or for uh, one of the, the larger construction contracts. Right? So we have capital requirement. If you don't know, if you're trying to make a, um, if you're making a bid to be a contractor for any of the construction uh, work that's done at the university or even through the city, you need to be licensed, bonded, insured. That takes money. And oftentimes it doesn't take money being spent. It takes, it takes money to, to, that, that you're shown that you have. So can you actually show that you have $100,000 in the bank in order to get a million dollar um, uh, insurance policy uh, so that you can bid for the contract? No, you don't have that because you're not wealthy, right? So, or people don't tell you, like there are other black people on YouTube who'll tell you that like it only takes a few hundred dollars to get a business license. And if you get a business license, that means you're a business. Well, no, that's not true. Um, just filing LLC paperwork does not like, make you a business person. Um, <laughs> first of all, it's, it's more than just a few hundred dollars because costs do crap in. Like actually to get in the game and not be an exception, to get in the game as a business person and not be an exception, you need access to about 30K. To get in the game as a business person, this isn't for all businesses all the time, but honestly about 30K um, more depending on how much equipment you need to get and how many hits you need to get and what we're talking about um, in terms of marketing. Um, but you need about 30K. Am I doing all right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, you need about 30K um, to actually get your business going if you're serious about like actually growing into the future. And that's like the low end. It more helps. Um, so access to wealth is what black people need in order to get stably into the middle class. And we're not going to get that access to wealth thinking about individuals and thinking about success as a property of individuals, right? We're not going to get that access to wealth by thinking about success as a property of individuals. And insofar as we teach our children that they should think about success as a property of individuals, it will never lead to the quality of black community stability that we um, deserve and that we were locked out of. And how were we locked out of um, that, that community stability? Well, we were locked out of that community stability. Like I said, Matthew's not here, so I'm, I'm wearing a few hats right now. We were locked out of that uh, community stability because um, you know, up until about last week, and I say it's, uh, this isn't necessarily last week, but I am saying that, uh, you know, 1964 wasn't. All right, so I got the sound back. So up until the, um, the 60s, we, were ha we had the Klan openly marching in the street. And this is just when the picture was taken. This wasn't like this was their last march. This is just the one we have, like, out for. So um, that terrorized an entire generation of black people just kind of not to ask for their cut. So now we need the quality of education that will get black people asking for their cut and demanding their cut for the sake of the black community. And that's the quality of political education we need. That's the quality of political justice we need. Because now we need redress for this terrorism. We need, and I'm pointing to the, we need redress for this, for this terrorism. This is why there isn't a black locksmith right now who does all of the, uh, the work. 
Um, because after the Civil War, um, pretty much the white Southern economy still needed black people to pick cotton. So they, a slew of organizations, I'll do it in a different show on this, but there was a slew of public and private policies that kept black people picking cotton and being domestic labor such that into the 50s, 75% uh, of the black workforce were domestic laborers or and uh, sharecroppers, which means that even today, we're only in 13 occupations. There's another, there's a... Um, only sizably, in any sort of like real numbers, we only do 13 things. I want us to do all the things. All of the things. If there's a thing that's done that, in, in, that involves um, money hand to hand that you could actually put on a W-2, I want us in that business. Um, but to be in that business, we need to bust in. There's a woman in the audience right now from Oregon. She didn't know that uh, until 1926, Black people were not allowed to buy property in Oregon, which means there's a huge lumber industry in Oregon. By 1926, all of the land where the trees were built was already sewn up, which means black people did not get that lumber money. I want black people to get that lumber money. I want black people. You can look at, uh, there was an article that came out about a month ago where um, it turned out that I want to say, either Johnny Walker or Jim Beam, I'm going to say Jim Beam, the, the recipe came from one of Jim Beam's slaves. Now it's a $12 billion industry. Um, um, and I, I, want, I want a cut of that money. Not me. I want my people to get a cut of that $12 billion. Um, but instead of that education, and if you look up the article, you'll, you'll find a descendant of the slave from whom Jim Beam stole that intellectual property, say that, well, you know, we're not looking for a handout. We just like a plaque or anything. No, it's not a handout. Black people, that's not a handout. You think Bill Gates or Elon Musk or um, Steve Jobs, when they sue for intellectual property, they're thinking, they're thinking in terms of handout? No, they're thinking in terms of their cut. And it was actually... Jack Daniels, Jack Daniels. Thank you, YouTube. Thank you, YouTube, for keeping me, uh, keep me honest, keep me whole. Uh, Jack Daniels. Um, yeah, no, it's a $12 billion company now, and, and, uh, and, like, and our people are still broke. And then the descendants of those people are just asking for a, uh, a not a cut, they're just asking for a plaque when like, they should be asking for like $2 billion. <laughs> In ca make that out to cash. <laughs> make that check out to cash. So why have we been so confused about uh, what we're owed and why we should get it? Well, it's because people who actually decided what we know about history and what we know about um, what we're owed, they've gotten serious about our political education when we haven't gotten serious about our own political education. So this is what... Uh, I'm going to play a video right now, and I'm going to tell you about it once it's done, about the people who've decided what you learn in school. That's from History of Georgia, a textbook published in 1954 that was taught across junior high schools in Georgia for decades. That sort of language is part of an intellectual movement called the Lost Cause, a distorted version of American Civil War history that's been prevalent in the South for a long time. It took shape soon after the defeat of the Confederate States in the war, when Southern historians like Edward Pollard and former Confederate General Jubal Early started preserving the South's perspective through their writings. They framed the Confederate cause as a heroic defense of the Southern way of life against the overwhelming forces in the North. That narrative has a few basic tenets. The glorification of Confederate soldiers who died for a cause they believed in, the belief that slavery was a benevolent institution, and maybe most importantly, that slavery was not the root cause of the war. The Lost Cause is one of the most notoriously effective efforts to rewrite history, and it was done by the losing side. So how did it become so deeply rooted in Southern memory? Blame the United Daughters of the Confederacy. The UDC was founded in Nashville in 1894 to preserve Confederate culture for generations to come. The women who made up the group descended from elite antebellum families, and they used their social and political clout to spread the pro-Southern version of the war as real history. You've probably seen their efforts to honor the Confederacy, but maybe you didn't know it was the UDC. They're the ones who covered the Southern landscape with memorials for Confederate leaders and soldiers. They used their fundraising and lobbying skills to pressure local governments into erecting monuments in prominent 
public spaces like courthouses and state capitals. Installed here next to the state capitol by the United Daughters of the Confederacy. The United Daughters of the Confederacy donated this memorial to the city back in the 30s. They put them along roadsides and in parks. Any place that was remotely relevant to the Confederacy was memorialized. By the early 20th century, the UDC had 100,000 members and chapters spread all over the country, but mostly in former Confederate states. And there's a reason they grew so quickly during that time. So we're talking about roughly three decades after the end of the war, and the Confederate veterans themselves are beginning to die off. So there is this push to find ways to commemorate it, because the big challenge by 1900 was there's a new generation of white Southerners being born, and they never experienced the, the war years. That push is visible. Most of the Confederate monuments were erected during the UDC's height of influence. There's a rhetoric around monuments that we want to get the this thing built before all of that generation has died off. And the reason we want it is to teach future generations about those men. Dr. Karen Cox wrote the book on the UDC, and I asked her if it was fair to say the group established the lost cause as historical fact in the South. Oh my God, yeah. They were the leaders of the lost cause into the 20th century, and they made it a movement about vindication. Just to give you an idea of how effective they were, they successfully lobbied for a Confederate memorial in Arlington National Cemetery, which U.S. President Woodrow Wilson proudly unveiled to a cheering crowd. Now that's influence, right? Monuments are the least of what they did. Uh, what? I mean, they, they are the most visible and tangible, but the work with children was far more influential. It turns out a central UDC objective is shaping how children think about the war and their Southern heritage. One of their most powerful tools, textbooks. Take a look at this pamphlet called A Measuring Rod for Textbooks. It was written by the illustrious Southern historian Miss Mildred Rutherford, an educator, orator, and author of Southern history textbooks. She's also very pro-slavery. The pamphlet announced the formation of a textbook review committee featuring prominent Southerners like five former Confederate generals. This group was committed to spreading the truths of Confederate history, so they instructed school boards to reject any textbooks that did not accord full justice to the South. And they urged libraries to deface every book in their collection that didn't measure up by writing the words unjust to the South clearly on its cover. This pamphlet was shared widely with school boards throughout the South, and UDC-backed committees closely monitored history books to make sure Northern influence never reached classrooms. So the core language of an approved textbook aligned precisely with that of the lost cause. You know, stuff like, The Confederacy lost in the war between the states but Georgia never forgot to honor her Confederate soldiers. History of Georgia was on the UDC's approved list. It was also written by E. Merton Coulter, a self-described Southern historian and historian-described white supremacist. They understand that how you educate, who wins the writing game, who wins the, the battle over history, ultimately wins the war. That's the big fight for the UDC. But their work with children went further than the classrooms. The UDC formed an auxiliary group called the Children of the Confederacy, which which was designed to get kids born in former Confederate states to actively participate in their version of history. Group leaders had kids recite call and response truths from something called the Confederate Catechism. Children up to the age of 18 would compete and be rewarded for memorizing long passages of lost cause rhetoric. So it would be like an after school thing, you know, like that was your club. You would go after school to the meeting of the children of the Confederacy and your leader might teach you songs of the South like Dixie or other songs that were considered Southern patriotic songs. They would have them write essays, go visit the veterans, and learn this catechism. Children were also the centerpiece of their community's monument unveilings, like this living flag at the dedication of the Stonewall Jackson Monument in Richmond. Yes, those are school children. The UDC's efforts shaped the identities of children who grew up with the lost cause. They made history personal, and that made their story last longer. Generations of generations of children learning that narrative in a variety of ways grow up to be, you know, segregationist in the 50s and 60s, because that's been drilled into them since they were children. After World War I, the UDC started losing steam, but the damage was done. The monuments were in place, and the textbooks they wrote remained in Southern classrooms until the late 70s. And the women's group did it all without the right to vote or participate in politics. You can still get glimmers of this lost cause memory of the war from people who will always choose to see it through the personal. And I think the UDC, to a great extent, was that was their goal. So the next time someone says the Confederate monuments are about remembering our history, just know that that's exactly what the United Daughters of the Confederacy wants you to think. So America, 
Um, we learned our history about what we're owed and what we're not owed and who did what to whom and why from people who cared more about preserving the memories of their spouses and fathers and grandfathers than they care about making sure the truth is told about our history. And there are stakes to that. There are stakes to doing history by the ideal of the personal. Like it seems like, it seems benign that like that these women went out of their way to lobby to teach a quality of history that uh, will honor their spouses and parents and grandfathers and legitimize whatever gains they had gotten. It seems benign. It seems like it's no big deal. But it turns out that it leads to confusion. It, it leads to confusion about who is owed what to whom and what... Um, and what, our, our, what truth looks like in our world and in our, in, our, in, in our claims for justice, right? So we need the quality of political education that's not tied, and this is a general claim. This isn't just about um, what happens to go on in black schools for black children. We need a quality of political education for everybody Hey, Ms. Roberts, uh, we need a quality of political education for everybody that's calibrated to justice claims um, that have been ignored viciously and purposefully by this quality of history. This is what happens. This is the quality of political history and political sensibility you'll get when you do history through the personal, through when it's just about you and what your feelings uh, there, there's, a, there's a guy named Blumenberg who wrote a book on myth, and he pretty much says that uh, in the absence of history, in the absence of true history, myth takes the vacuum. I'll say that again. In the absence of history, myth takes up the vacuum. And the myths that we have been taught have been calibrated to make those white women feel good about their lineage. And that's a problem. That's a problem for us. That's a problem for our justice claims. And is that, is that right? Good. That's a problem for us. That's a problem for our justice claims. So we need a quality of political education that's calibrated to the truth. And we need a quality of political education that's calibrated so that people know what they're doing why they, and why they're doing it so that when they actually come into power, they'll be able to wield that power responsibly. Because now, I'll tell you the quality of political education we're getting right now. Um, if, if you don't wield that quality, the quality of political education that's adequate to um, our needs as black people and our justice claims, do you know who decides what your kids learn? If you don't advocate for the quality of political education that we need, do you know who decides what we learn? These people do. Now I'm going to give you a, uh, a uh, picture of the school board, uh, not the school board, of the, um, the teaching staff at one of our local schools. Now this local school, the, 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 the tuition is, the tuition is about 10, 15, maybe $20,000 a year. And these teachers decide what the kids learn and can you I I suspect in a town that's 30 percent black the teachers at the school might not teach the quality of history that black people need to get the quality of justice that they need I suspect at this Christian school what they learn is white supremacy with a little bit of Jesus kind of sprinkled in on top in the way of seasoning it's kind of um you know like salt or actually pepper um, so if we don't get serious about what we expect every child to know as a matter of American history, because anti-black history is American history, we can't be surprised when black people continue to be locked out. Um, some of it, yeah, and we can't, and like, if we have a history curriculum and a political education curriculum that's calibrated to maintaining white feelings, 
that will not be the truth and that will not be the quality of political history that we need and the quality of political education that we need for black people to make the claims that they need to a quality of citizenry that means white people included and non-black people who will actually be prepared to hear it. Right? So we need this in the public school curriculum, not just for black kids, but for white kids as a, and non-black kids as a matter of American history. Because the American history that they have been taught is confusing. It's actually not confusing. It's intentionally misguided. To, it's calibrated to preserve their feelings. And that's not a real history. And there are actually consequences to it. It's, there are consequences insofar as when black people even learn that history, they get confused about the claims that they can make and ought to make. So we have a lot of scared black people who are confused about the role of government in their lives. Yeah, and that's a problem. Um, and there are other people who make this claim. I'm going to give you um, one more person who makes the claim. In an important way, I feel like, uh, let me just find the clip. Just give me a second, people. And that's important. I mean, like, think about the consequences of, of having that kind of power. This is one of the things that the right gets that the left has no idea what to do with. The, the right gets that if you want to actually, like, move people in a democracy, you go at public education. They're trying to put creation in schools, right? Um, they're actually, not because it's true, but because it's what they want. And they know that if you want it and you want it to get it through, you go through um, public education. And the left doesn't get in that battle. The left doesn't get, on the get in the battle on the curriculum. And that's why we lose. Um, because the curriculum is what is where we learn that, for example, in Oregon, there wasn't, uh, black people couldn't buy land, so what does the state of Oregon? And that's the way they solved the black people. They didn't want to be a, the, their black people problem. They didn't want to be a slave state, um, but they also didn't want Negroes. So the way you do that is just not let black people buy land. Well, we're not slave, we're good people. We don't, we don't have slavery. <laughs> yeah, we also just didn't let black people buy land. Um, so uh, that's the way they solved their problem. Um, but that also put a disproportionate uh, pressure on, you know, South Carolina <laughs> or all the other places that actually had black people and had to deal with the struggles of trying to integrate a community um, after we've been using these people for property for so long. Uh, all right, so... We need to teach history the way we need to teach history um, in a way that's appropriate to the claims that historical degradation has wrought on the black community. And also, we need to teach that not just to black people, we need to teach it to everybody, which means we need to get it in the public school curriculum as a matter of justice and as a matter of the truth. Yes? Can you also point out why it's important in the public school education? versus, say, charter schools? Yeah, so it's important. Like, people would say, like, well, you know, black people, we just need to homeschool our kids. First of all, black people go to uh, public school. Like, less than 1% of black people are being homeschooled right now. So, like, any solution we have about black political education, we need it in the public schools. And also, um, this isn't a matter of choice. This isn't a matter of charter school, like, choice about what your kids should learn. This is a matter of American history. You can't choose your way out of learning American history. So it's not just a matter of the charter school curriculum. It's about this should be along with uh, 2 plus 2 equals 4. And in addition to that, we've been locking black people out and terrorizing them for most of the country's history. And it, it wasn't a benign institution. On, we've been doing it on purpose as a matter of us wanting what we wanted. And we... Um, was susceptible to this by a women's group who couldn't even have power to vote. Like, in a well-ordered world, that little six-minute documentary should be screened every year in every school in the United States. Um, but the reason it's not it's because, is because they, we have a history, we have a public sensibility that is worried more about calibrating to white feelings than it is about the truth. And that's a political sensibility that needs to change. 
Because history isn't about the personal. It isn't about your feelings. It's about what we need to understand about our life in order to do justice um, to ourselves. And so I worry, and let me circle this back to the, to the, to the lack of black lawyers, um, or the, the lack of black lawyers who are willing to do the quality of civil rights work that needs to be done. It's because we haven't educated them in why they should become lawyers. It's because we haven't educated them in why we support them becoming lawyers. We've taught them a quality of success that identifies success with an individual come up. And honestly, in the black community, an individual come up means an individual go out. That means leave the black community. And that's, that's a problem. And that's a problem we need to address uh, wholeheartedly and um, earnestly. Earnestly. We need to redefine success. And we, we need to redefine success in terms of doing justice. And for white people, we need to redefine success as a matter of doing justice and redress for ill-gotten gains because as we've concentrated the political risk and the economic burden and degradation of being black in America to uh, concentrated poverty in black communities, we've also given white people a, a 150 year holiday from pooling the risk and pooling the degradation that has made America, right? So black communities are disproportionately poor so that white communities can be disproportionately um, uh, uh, can get their risk holiday, as opposed to all of us dealing with, as Americans, the burden of our historical legacy. So now I'm going to open it up for questions from the audience, and we're going to get this going. All right, so audience, get up there. Is anything I said new, or Adam, what's, what's, what's on your mind? Yeah, yeah, you have to go up there. Yeah, you know, you're an adult. You take up space in this world. All right, hold on. Okay. <laughs> Can you swing the microphone a little bit? There you go. Perfect. And now let me, the good people on YouTube probably want to see who you are. Yeah, what's up? Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm thinking about the ways in which um, white people who are the policymakers don't yeah. want to do anything from a policy standpoint or elevate subjugated knowledges unless it also explicitly benefits white people or doesn't necessarily affect them. So <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. So I'm thinking like, how do we do, how do we insert this? Where do you want me no, to No, that's fine. If you just move the whole microphone a foot and a half oh, okay. over. Um, yeah, that's very good. So how do you insert so this? So how do we insert this into public school curriculum when the people making those decisions are largely Averse. white people. Yeah, yeah, white people. All right, so we need better media. So that's why, first of all, white people, if you're good allies, go over to the Funky Academic. Um, this, is, this is actually important. It's not just a plug. First of all, subscribe to this channel. Tell your friends to subscribe to this channel. Pass this around. If you're an educator and you think that you're, you, uh, you care about justice and you're an educator... You know, you need to watch this in your class and have a discussion about what I'm saying and what we're, what, what we're talking about in, in this class. Have this discussion um, and pass this around and send it on your listservs uh, so that we raise the quality of knowledge about what it is to be a, a responsible citizen. Because what I'm talking about is just a quality of knowledge about what it is to be a responsible citizen. So a lot of people don't know um, that. So go to thefunkyacademic.com. Um, look at some of my previous videos. Or, or, uh, and then we also need to get serious about like, sharing this information on your, social ne on your social networks. So if you're on Twitter, tweet it out. Um, if you are on... Facebook, post it. Um, and also, honestly, like white people, I'd like to be able to pay my interns more. And, you know, there are lights and cameras. Uh, if you have five, ten dollars a month, let's be honest, if you have fifty dollars a month, go to the panel on the right side of this, of, of the funky academic site and kick down um, 
And it's not just PayPal, it has your credit card too. So just click on the icon and uh, get these subscribers up. And the more money that I can generate with the media, the more I can actually grow this program because it shouldn't just be a black Athenians. Um, this, is, this is a program that I think is portable. That means it'll help you build a black politics in St. Louis. It'll help you build a black politics in Gainesville, in Greensboro, in, in Richmond. I feel like Richmond's just Athens, just bigger. Um, that is actually really <laughs> Yeah, just Athens, just like bigger, like more, there's more inequality, more money, just more. Um, so, more industry, because the tobacco is the base there. Yeah, more exploitation. I think there's like this big slave block that was like, it was one of the big points. So like, definitely we can do it in, in, in Athens, we can do it in Richmond. Um, so we need a better media. The media game is where we lose, the, is where we lose this. So, um, and don't just think it was the UDC that did it. There's another group that's, there are many other like white women behaving badly groups in, in the South um, right now. And I'm going to put up a picture of one. Now, these are just uh, apparently concerned women from Georgia. But like, make no mistake, these women do not have the Negro in mind. Uh, or justice. This is just the UDC. Um, this is just, this is from the website, Concerned Women, uh, Concerned Women from Georgia, for Georgia. And uh, like there are, no, there are many different other social societies and tea clubs um, who are organized to pay for, uh, organized to lobby for and organize themselves around keeping the heritage or keeping the, um, the institutional memory preserved in a certain way, that might not be true. That is not true. They're actually inst they're, they're organized to keep America supremacist. And that's a problem for at least me. Should be a problem if you're white for you. And definitely if you're a problem for a black, it, 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 it is your problem. Um, so how we do this is through media. Honestly, I want a newsletter. I want an 11 and a half, 11 by 17 um, piece of paper folded, hard copy. Not, every, not everyone has the internet. Don't, don't let the, the masses believe you. I want something like, I want my own little final call, except without the, the bow ties and the bean pies. Um, uh, just give me a newsletter that uh, will actually allow us to change the quality of discourse about these issues. And that newsletter, I want it to be hard. And so in order to do that, I need money. So go to thefunkyacademic.com and, and kick in a few dollars a month for the quality of media that will lead to a quality of politics. Because we need to make it be known that a quality of politics and a quality of education that is merely calibrated to white lady feelings is not going to be sufficient to get justice for all of us. Right? And I'll say that again. A quality of media and a quality of politics that is calibrated to make sure Johnny doesn't feel bad is not going to be adequate for, hey, what's up, my man? Um, for uh, justice for black people. And it's not an adequate, uh, it's not an accurate or an adequate education. And there's another book um, uh, by a woman named Danielle Allen. It's called, oh, all this, uh, yeah. Uh, another book by Daniel Allen. It's called Equality in Education. And she makes a very stirring argument um, that I think is right for a lot of reasons. Uh, yeah, and the argument in this book is that uh, education and equality. The argument in this book is that, like, look, the STEM push, especially in black communities, is dishonest. Because we actually make enough money. We make enough money in those communities, not in those particular black communities, because those black people are poor. But like in a place like Athens with its $8.5 billion GDP, we actually make enough money. So the problem isn't the quality of education of the students, uh, like of the black communities within those larger polities. The problem is the political distribution of goods, right? And so in order to get justice, we need to affect 
the political distribution of goods. And in order to have a citizenry that's actually adequate to winning justice, we need the quality of education that trains people to be able to participate in their political sphere in order to redistribute the money that's generated in those local economies. So the problem isn't that not enough black people don't know um, how to take a derivative and set it equal to zero. You can be, do very well in America without taking derivatives. Um, in fact, if you're black and you can take a derivative and set it equal to zero or take an integral or whatever, it doesn't, doesn't mean anything. You could still be broke. I have a, uh, one of my students whose mother has a math degree from Fisk. Your mother got a math degree from Fisk. You know, did everything right. She can do all those maths. And um, she's now a church janitor. And before being a church janitor, she worked at, uh, she was a, was a cafeteria lady. So the problem wasn't that she didn't know math. The problem was that she was black, related to other black people in a town, in a world that's a little bit hostile to black people. So until we get the politics right, um, that will be the case for too many of our college graduates who do everything right and then end up with a lot of debt for their trouble and no way out. Uh, so that's a problem. And it's a problem that will only come through a political education that's calibrated for justice, not a political education that's calibrated for white feelings, for the personal. And this isn't even just about like me looking out for my tribe. Um, this is about me caring about justice in America. This is about me caring about justice in America. And this is a problem, right? And this is what Freddie Hampton was talking about when he said that if you give poor, starving people power without education, they're just going to want more. And this was, the, this was the problem apparently in the French Revolution where like uh, Hannah Arendt wrote this book about uh, comparison of revolutions, the uh, American Revolution and the French Revolution. And she said, one of the problems with the French Revolution is you, got, you gave these starving people like power and money, and then once they got power, uh, power and food, and then once they got power, what, they, didn't, they just wanted more because that's all they want, that's all they knew, want. You didn't get the education along with it. And that's, that is a reason why our black lawyers don't come back and do civil rights work, especially pro bono, because now we've given them people who are starving, historically, starving for wealth and striving, we've given them access to resources, and now all they know is individual striving. So we need the political education that goes along with the technical knowledge, um, lest we uh, end up just creating an oppressor class, another anti-black class who happens to be black. And there's a, uh, there's a saying out there that goes, all skin folk ain't kin folk. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's unfortunately the truth. However, uh, with the political education, uh, skin folk can be the best kin folk. And uh, there's another quote. Uh, yeah, sure. Adam, what's up? Yeah. So I, like, jumping off of what you were just saying, I think part of this is education in our schools just what politics is in the first place? Right. Like, never mind what specifically we're teaching, which is really important, obviously, but just the fact that these things are contestable in the first place. <laughs> the, right, we're talking about how we distribute the wealth that there is in Athens. So that the question of who gets the stuff, so what stuff there is, what stuff we make, who and how we make it, and who gets that stuff is a question determined by politics, not right. by some like, independent law of the universe, <laughs> I think is really important. Um, I think I'm disagreeing on one point, What's um, even though like the overall argument is spot on. Could you this, move the, the still yeah, a little definitely. bit too far? <laughs> yeah. This idea that like personal story isn't the way we should go about this. I think the problem isn't so much that we're um, telling personal stories. I mean, part of the problem is we don't talk about the systems that underlie those stories, obviously. Right, right, right. But it's also whose personal stories we tell. Because right. people attach to their history and the things they're learning through emotion, right? And we can, you know, 500 deaths is a statistic, but one person's death is a tragedy or whatever. Um, so this idea that if we were telling the stories of, so we talk about the systems that underlie these things, but if we were telling the stories of oppressed people, right, in the way that Howard Zinn tries to do in a people's history and that kind of thing, I think that allows us to latch on to that 
in a way that allows us then to feel that injustice in a way that's not just knowing it exists, but feeling it in a way that inspires us to act. I, I, no, let me, let me address a few things you're, you're speaking. I think that's actually, you're, you're not wrong there, right? So one of my claims, one of my problems with Obama, and I, I think this is a fair critique, is after 12 years or after eight years, Actually, even after 25 years, after Bill Clinton said that hey, the government's over, after 20 years, people don't know about the role of government in their lives, right? So if you told your personal story, if I said, like, look, all right, so I'm from California. Um, what if, if you, in order to know me, you need to know about the policies that created a music program in my seventh grade school that allowed me to play oboe and then still play oboe. And, like, these public school music programs kind of taught me about excellence because if you learn excellence in classical music, it turns out that it transfers and you learn excellence in other aspects of your life. And then also I went to a, a public school, Berkeley, which was not free, but it was, like, $1,400 a semester when I went there. And, like, that's, like, first of all, it's not that now. Um, second of all, that matters a lot because if it, any dollar above that would be a dollar in loans I would be paying today. Um, so like these government policies actually matter, right? So like, and I got there through affirmative action. So if anyone is enjoying anything I'm saying right now, let me tell you, Becky, who like thinks she, that she would have gotten my spot, wouldn't be in my spot right now giving this quality of political education. So like, I'm sorry, Abigail Fisher, until you make the, the argument that you would be doing this show, <laughs> America needs me to get the quali that quality of education more than it needs, to, needs you. Um, so we don't talk about the role of government in our lives. Uh, and we don't talk about the role of government in our lives. And even black people who make it, they talk about it as if they make it because of some sort of moral quality that they have. Um, so they feed into the narrative that like, no, my moral decisions emerged out of like a political bed, which is the way we should talk about, um, uh, uh, our individuality in life. They talk about it like, no, there were no systems. I just made it because I tried hard. I work it. And the biggest uh, notion, the biggest kind of crime, uh, propaganda crime, is about entrepreneurs. You, like, entrepreneurs aren't entrepreneurs because they tried hard. And they're not better than you. They have access to wealth. They have access to that 30K. Actually, they have access to... 120K so they can fail the first three times. <laughs> and, and on that fourth time, having learned uh, how to fail, um, you know, actually make it. And then they have, they have access to networks of wealth. They have fraternity bros who, um, who, unlike black people, unlike your fraternity brothers, aren't in debt. They're not just flossing. They pay for things for cash, whereas we pay for credit. Like, their parents give them a house, not just like, you know... The, uh, the, 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 not, not like, I notice in the South, parents pay for whole houses. Like, not just down payments, they pay for whole houses. Here's a house. Because, like, land is cheap. I didn't know that was the case. We don't have it like that. We get a little bit of your wedding and a little bit of your down payment. Although, honestly, I know black people who went into debt for their weddings, and they go, we're going into debt for funerals. And that's a problem. White, white people don't have that problem. Well, that's a different problem. It's not that they all have money. It's just that they don't, even the poor ones know somebody so that they don't have to go in debt for a, uh, for a funeral. Like, that's, that's just not a problem um, that, we should, that, that, that our community should be dealing with. But um, we're not honest about the role of government in our lives. So if we tell our personal stories, and if politicians tell our personal stories with the role of government um, backstopping that personal story, that would be a kind of personal story I want. But right now, even the Democratic Party, we, we tell our, our politicians to tell their personal stories about like, how they made it individually, about how they're wonderful, how they grew up poor, and now they're on stage right now, and it's all because of them, as opposed to a lot of it has to do with good policies. And there would be more people, we would have the kind of community we, not, we need if there were more better policies. So that's a quality of political education I need my politicians doing, talking about the role of government in people's lives, because that matters. The 501c3 status matters versus the 501c4 and 5 status. Those things matter. And if you tell black people that, like, look, all right, you can, you can 
have a group that's a 501c3 and it'll be easier to get donations, but that means you're pretty much neutered with respect to the political demands you can make and, and, and claims you can make. Um, that's, a, that's a problem for a black group that actually wants to do the quality of black politics that we need. Um, so like this education in governance is uh, the quality of education we need. And the quality of education I like to do every Friday at 4 p.m. here in Broderick Flanagan's studio. Um, I actually like to buy a bigger spot than Broderick Flanagan's studio so I can invite more people because now I'm scared of inviting the entire community and then like not, people not having places to sit. So once again, go to thefunkyacademic.com. Um, go to thefunkyacademic.com. Sign up for... Uh, you know, five, ten, fifteen dollars a month. All right. So if you dr if you don't drink and you don't smoke and you don't tithe, you got a lot of extra money floating around. <laughs> so uh, you need to give a little bit of money a month to here, and maybe you should tithe a little bit. But um, after you tithe, after you go to the NAACP and join the NAACP, give a little bit of money here so I can continue to do the quality of black political education we need. Uh, so that even when we make it, even when individuals make it, they know what they're doing, who they owe, why they are here, and how to behave in a way that does justice, and how to advocate for a way that does justice, right? Because uh, I'm going to do a show on nonviolence um, in a few weeks, in probably about a month, uh, and I've, I've been reading a lot of Gandhi, and before you get on my page... Uh, tell me about Gandhi wasn't a big fan of black folk. That's right. Gandhi wasn't a huge fan of black people when he was in South Africa. And um, that's a problem. I'll talk about nonviolence then. But like I've been talking a lot about nonviolence. When he was in India, his biggest deal was, all right, so how do I get rid of the British and lead an insurrection in a way that the Indians themselves won't become oppressors? How do I lead an insurrection in a way so that I don't just create Indian oppressors? And that's the problem we need. How do we, that's, that's a similar problem to the problem black people have in America. How do I make it in America in a way so that I don't myself and my child doesn't my, him, him or herself become just a part of the problem? Um, so we need to redefine what it is to make it in America, and we need to redefine what it is to actually be a revolutionary and to be educated for revolution so that you don't yourself just become a Negro imperialist. Thank you for your time. Also, um, I'm in the comments. I, I, I watch the comments, and I pay attention to figure out how I can do a better job in the show and think about topics. So go ahead and comment and tell your friends to comment. I'll comment back. Um, let me hear what you have to say. Also, remember, this only works if we get this out. Let's get those subscriber numbers out. So subscribe, hit that little bell next to the subscribe icon. Tell your friends to subscribe and share this on, on your social media. All right? Um, I'm taking next week off because of the holiday. And after that, we're bringing in a uh, co-host, Amani. She's wonderful. And we're going to talk about diversity. And let's be honest, diversity, black people, that's not always us. San Francisco is very diverse. Not a lot of Negroes. Take care now. Peace.